Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today um, here at CSIS. My name is Kathleen Hicks. I direct the International Security Program here at CSIS and also am the Henry Kissinger Chair. Um, it's with great pleasure today that um, I introduce our main speaker, and that is Ms. Christine Wormuth, who is the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Strategy Plans and Forces. Christine has been the Deputy Undersecretary for Strategy Plans and Forces since August of 2012. In that time, since 2012, she's led the Quadrennial Defense Review for 2014, which is what she's here to speak about today. She also has more than 20 years of experience in the defense community, both in DOD, at the White House, here at CSIS as a Pratt alumni. Um, and most importantly, she is uh, currently the President's nominee to be the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. Um, after Christine speaks, we're going to do a little bit of question and answer that I will moderate here at the table. And then uh, following her speech, we're going to, of course, applause to, uh, applaud to let her leave. And then the, we'll have the panel that follows on on the budget and QDR featuring our CSIS experts. So please, without further ado, join me in welcoming Ms. Wormuth here to the stage. Oh, I'm just going to hitch myself up there. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for. Um, having me be here. As, as Dr. Hicks said, I am a proud alum of CSIS, and boy, this is my first time in the building. It is fabulous. <laughs> this is a big step up from the old digs in B1, so I'm very impressed and delighted to see how well CSIS is doing. Um, I thought I would talk to you all a little bit today about the QDR report that we just uh, delivered to the Hill last week. Um, some of you may have had the opportunity to look at the document. Um, I'll try to keep my remarks relatively brief, so we'll have uh, a lot of time for a question and answer, which I think almost everyone tends to find more enjoyable. Um, I thought before I go into sort of the substance of the QDR document, it might be interesting for some of you in the audience to hear a little bit about the process. I haven't talked a lot about that. but. Um, this was, I think, as some people know, a, certainly a different QDR from past QDRs. I've, I've been personally involved or observed all of the QDRs the department has done since they became sort of a requirement. And I think one of the most notable differences about this QDR was the fact that we had about half the time to do the review that we normally do. And I think that was a reflection, frankly, of primarily the, the very um, challenging environment we've had in the department for more than the past year. There's just been a tremendous amount of uncertainty, partic particularly fiscal uncertainty, that has led the department to be sort of in a continuous cycle of, um, of evaluating and trying to plan, um, starting with when I, when I took over the DUSD position from CAF, um, I went sort of straight into a program review cycle. Normally that, you know, wraps up at the end of the year and you have a little bit of a breather, but the department basically went straight into planning for sequestration. We then undertook the strategic choices and management review and then sort of segued straight into the QDR 2014 process as well as the then the, the next program review cycle. So it's been a very challenging time. Um, that said, Secretary Hagel felt strongly that it was important to take the QDR review as an important opportunity to step back, look at the security environment, relook the strategy, and, and use it as, a, among other things, a tool to lay out his vision for the department, because, of course, also um, this is the first QDR that has, uh, that has um, taken place underneath Secretary Hagel. To that end, he was involved in the process throughout. He gave us a lot of upfront guidance. Um, the day-to-day -day process was co-chaired by then Deputy Secretary Ash Carter and our Vice Chairman, Admiral Sandy Winnefeld. They, are, they were very, very involved. They also um, co-chaired, frankly, the budget review process. So there was a lot of um, good cross-fertilization between the two processes. We had, between QDR and budget review, we had more than 26 DMAGs in a very brief period of about three months. We had um, three senior leader councils that, that featured briefings on the QDR, and that the senior leader council is chaired by the secretary and the chairman, 
and then it involves all of the department senior leadership, the service chiefs, the service secretaries, the four undersecretaries, and each of the combatant commanders. So that's really an opportunity for the department's whole leadership team to get together in person and, and review collectively sort of the substance and use that as an opportunity to have good discussions and make decisions. So those, I think, were, were sort of important process milestones. Although it was a shorter, more compressed QDR than usual, it was we um, tried very hard to continue the tradition of having the QDR be inclusive and transparent and very collegial. We had five issue teams looking at various um, subjects from the strategy to a team looking at the force planning construct to a team looking at homeland defense issues, for example. We had representation from all of the services, all of the OSD organization, all of the com combatant commands, et cetera. So we really tried to sort of involve everyone. That, of course, doesn't mean that every organization was happy with where we wound up, um, but I think it's fair to say that, that all parts of the building had a voice in the process, and that's very important, I think, to having a coherent process or coherent result at the end that has integrity. So with that, why don't I transition into talking a little bit about the substance. Really, we tried to outline th three broad themes in the QDR report. The first was to describe what we're calling an updated defense strategy. This is a strategy that we believe is appropriate for the United States as a global leader. It's a strategy that we believe helps us protect our interests and advance those interests in the world and helps us sustain our, our global leadership role. A second um, objective and part of the QDR report is to talk about how we're responsibly and realistically rebalancing the joint force to be able to address the strategic environment and as well as uh, manage itself in a fiscally challenging environment. The third piece of the QDR report talks about both our commitment to protecting the all-volunteer force, making sure that we do things, for example, to um, be able to continue to recruit and retain an excellent military but also um, talk about how we are rebalancing the department internally, trying to again become more efficient and effective, and in particular trying to get um, a little bit more of our arms around the growth of our compensation packages inside the department, which make up a very large share of our budget and we think is something that we have to address in order to maintain a balanced force going into the future. The QDR report also talks, and I'll return to this in a few minutes, about what we see as the implications of returning to sequester in fiscal 16 on our defense strategy and the kinds of risks that we believe that poses to um, the ability of the military to execute the strategy going forward. I would characterize the QDR 2014 as an evolution of our strategy as opposed to a revolution in our strategy. And this is because, frankly, I think we had, the administration had our strategic priorities pretty much right in the 2012 defense strategic guidance. So we really went from the 2010 QDR, which was very focused on the two current wars at the time, Iraq and Afghanistan, to the 2012 defense strategic guidance, where we tried to lay out some of the important defense priorities for the 21st century. And now with QDR 2014, building on that DSG set of priorities to try to put the strategy in a slightly broader framework and really look forward to the kinds of challenges and opportunities we face in the future. We started that process, we started the review process, and we certainly start the QDR report with a discussion of what we see in our security environment. And I think it's fair to say we see the security environment as being very, continuing to be quite challenging. It's volatile. There are a lot of threats out, of, out there. Uh, we also, however, see opportunities. So I, this is definitely, I think I, I read another defense official being quoted as saying, you know, this is not a um, post-Cold War, early 90s kind of security environment where we think that we're, we're going to have the opportunity to sort of take a breath. We still see the security environment as being very challenging. The report talks about um, the continuing importance of the Asia-Pacific region, for example, which again links to our continuing strategic emphasis on continuing the rebalance in that region. We also see a number of challenges, obviously, in the Middle East. Um, Syria, particularly focused on the political transitions that are still ongoing that we think will take some time to complete. We are increasingly concerned with the growing Sunni-Shia tensions in that region, so there's a lot there that we have to continue to keep our eye on. 
We're very focused on the continuing terrorist threat, which as many different um, officials from the department has, have observed is metastasizing, it's spreading. Some people have used the word franchising. Certainly, while we think that the overall threat to the homeland is lower than it was immediately after 9-11, we continue to see significant threats posed by Al-Qaeda and its affiliates. So that's something that we're very focused on. We're also looking at sort of the challenging domains of cyber and space. Those are very important um, capability areas for us and for our joint force, of course, but we are also closely monitoring the investments that the investments that other countries are making in those two areas and thinking about what kinds of vulnerabilities that poses for us. And then there's just an increasing range of technological developments that, that are, again, impacting the kind of operational environment that we face. The continuing growth of A2AD capabilities, for example, things like the advent of 3D printing, um, mini drones, just all sorts of things that are sort of um, seem to be more science fiction five to ten years ago, but are now very much becoming realities. So in, the, in that context, we've tried to lay out an updated strategy that has three basic pillars. The first is protecting the homeland uh, in terms of being able to deter attacks against the United States, defeat attacks if necessary, and manage the consequences, for example, of something like a natural disaster, anything from sort of smaller disasters to something large like Hurricane Katrina. I think I'd stop there and say that um, the, the emphasis on homeland and protecting the homeland is part of the sort of updating to the strategy that we're doing compared to, for example, 2012 DSG, which didn't talk in, at great length about um, the DOD's role in protecting the homeland. The second part of our strategy is building security globally. This is really what we're talking about when we have um, the department's forward presence around the world, things like our building partnership capacity activities, exercises, mill-to-mill -mill engagements, port visits, all of the things of that nature. And really the goal of that part of our strategy is to try to deter conflict at the earliest point possible, to try to prevent coercive behavior, for example, and to sort of proactively and positively shape the environment so that we're trying to prevent conflict rather than having to deal with it after it's already manifested. The third and final pillar in the strategy is projecting power and winning decisively. This is the more sort of kinetic part of the strategy. But what we're talking about here is the ability of the United States military to really go anywhere in the world and project power has sort of been a signature of our military over the years, and it's one we think that's very important to maintain, whether that's to be able to respond to conflict or whether it's to come to the aid of a country like the Philippines when they were dealing with their typhoon. We want to be able to do both of those, and if necessary, to deal with aggression um, when and if it happens. So within those three strategic pillars, and I think it's important to mention, we see these as sort of interrelated and interdependent. They are not mutually exclusive. So in terms of, you know, thinking about the parts of our military or the kinds of capabilities that we have in our military, they don't bin neatly into one pillar uh, and not the other two. In many cases, the, the services play a role in each, each of the three parts of the pillars. The kinds of capabilities that we're developing and that we have already can play a role in multiple parts of the strategy. Another important part of the updated strategy that we put forward in the QDR report is an emphasis on innovation and adaptability. And here we're trying to go beyond, I think in the past the department has, also, has often talked about innovation or efficiency in the context of sort of better business practices. How can we, um, you know, function more efficiently as an institution? Here we're trying to think about that certainly, but to go beyond that and thinking about how can we build in innovation into the strategy itself, into how we try to execute that strategy. So for example, a big part of the QDR process that isn't frankly um, highlighted in the document was a very extensive review of our, of our operational concepts for some of our war plans to try to really push innovation in those areas. We've also done things like looking carefully at the way we deploy forces to conduct forward presence activities. Can we do that in new ways? Can we deploy carrier groups, for example? Can we, can we perhaps break off a surface action group to go and do a set of activities 
much farther away than the, than the sort of large carrier strike group, for example. We're also trying to pursue innovation with some of our closer partners and allies like the UK, for example. So we've had extensive dialogue with the Brits in particular, looking at how we can do more in terms of joint training, how we can leverage the fact that they will be buying joint strike fighters and how we can do more to train for, say, carrier operations, but also to work with them on, on strategic planning activities. So, for example, working with the Brits to, at the front of our security cooperation planning processes, to say, how can we synchronize the different types of things we're doing so that both countries get the most bang for the buck in terms of what they're doing? And how can we try to sort of avoid redundancy that can happen when you're not talking closely with a partner about the kinds of activities they have in mind? So those are some of the things that we're trying to do in the innovation um, category. Stepping back sort of big picture, our view is that at the president's budget level, which is $115 billion more than the BCA cap level, we can execute this strategy, this global leadership strategy, although we will experience increased risk in some areas. For example, in the near term, we're going to have some challenges in terms of readiness, for example, that may that will cause us to have to be somewhat more selective in, the, in terms of the kinds of activities that we do in terms of engagement. Um, but overall, we feel like we can execute this strategy at that level. Um, the strategy also, oh, the report, excuse me, talks at length about how we're going to rebalance the force to be able to align to these strategic pillars. Some of, and there's essentially what we're trying to do, given the fiscal environment, is to reshape the force in such a way that it remains in balance between capacity, the size of our forces, capability, which is sort of shorthand for the level of modernization of our forces, and also the readiness level of our forces. And, and readiness, in, readiness in general has been a challenge for us in the last couple of years, in part because we're, of course, coming out of a decade of very um, stressing operations, but also particularly in FY13 when sequestration was in place, we took very significant hits to our O&M accounts, which had a negative effect on readiness. So we're in the process of trying to bring those three elements of our force into better balance. And to do that, we will have to undertake some of the steps that Secretary Hagel has been outlining in the last couple of weeks, such as, for example, bringing down the size of the Army, the active Army, for example, to 440 to 450,000 personnel to having the Marine Corps be sized at about 182,000, to um, taking some of the platforms out of the Air Force, for example, like the A-10 platform. So those are things we're doing in order to make sure we have sufficient resources to plow back into modernization, for example, as well as readiness. We also, in the report, talk in some detail about several of the capability areas where we're making investments, particularly in capabilities that we believe are important to be able to execute the strategy. And in many cases, these were capability areas that we also highlighted in the DSG. So for example, we, we will be making investments in our counterterrorism capabilities, most visibly the fact that the department has decided to continue to grow our special operations forces to almost 70,000 personnel. We'll be making investments in our cyber capabilities. For example, the report talks about the fact that by 2016, the department will have three different types of cyber forces that will be, that will be oriented on helping combatant commanders, for example, be able to build cyber activities into their plans. We will have a set of forces that are focused on defending DOD networks, and we will have a set of forces that are focused on defending the nation against offensive operations from adversaries. So those are just a couple of examples of the kinds of investments we're making, but we also talk about missile defense, precision strike, ISR, a number of capabilities, again, that we feel are very important to our overall strategy. The last big piece of the report before talking about the implications of sequester relates to how we're going to rebalance the department itself while we protect the health of the all-volunteer force. And I think Secretary Hagel and the chairman feel very strongly that the foundation of our military is the all-volunteer force and that ensuring that we sustain the health of our human capital, both military and civilian and contractor, 
is critically important. So we will continue to make sure that we are focused on doing things like, for example, continuing to fight the sexual assault problems that we have in the military with a real emphasis on trying to develop approaches that, uh, that show measurable progress towards reducing the number of incidents. We will be investing continued resources in doing what we can to try to prevent the rising rate of suicide that the military has been experiencing. We will be making sure that we have family programs, things like transition assistance programs for our folks who are, who are becoming veterans, taking care of our wounded warriors. All of those things are important programs that we're protecting, even in an era of fiscal constraint. The flip side of that is that over the last 10 years, our compensation programs have grown at a fairly healthy rate. And right now, the glide slope of that um, growth of compensation will not be sustainable over time for the department if we want to try to keep the overall force in balance. So part of what we're doing in the QDR, it, it outlines these proposals in some detail. We've put forward with the 15 budget a series of relatively modest reforms to try to slow the growth of compensation. So things like slowing the, the size of the pay raise, for example, or making some reductions to our base housing allowance program or reducing to some extent the subsidy for our commissaries. Those are all things that we think we have to do in order to keep our force healthy overall. And I think it's important to note a couple of things on this. First of all, these are not draconian proposals. We worked very hard in the department to come up with a package of reforms that are sustainable. And the, the chairman, the service chiefs, the senior enlisted advisors all worked together for almost a year to develop this package. This was not something that OSD dictated from on high, for example. This was something we said we need to get more control of the growth of compensation, and the department turned to the chairman and the service chiefs to work together to come up with a package that they felt they could stand behind and that they felt was a responsible set of reforms. So that's very important. I think it's also worth noting that relative to other areas of the budget where we decided we needed to make some adjustments, the compensation piece had more modest adjustments compared to other pieces. So we really tried to be very spare in terms of um, trying to find savings in the compensation area. Turning last but not least to what we see as the implications of sequestration on this defense strategy. We've put forward, again, I think a strategy and a plan for rebalancing the military that at the president's budget level, we believe will give us what we need to get the job done. If we return to sequestration in FY16 and beyond, we believe that the risks to our strategy will rise significantly. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about how we see that happening or why we see that happening. If we have to go back to sequestration level cuts, we will have to reduce the size of the, of the force further. So for example, I'm sure you've all seen, we would take the Army down even lower to about 420,000 active personnel. We would bring the Marine Corps down to 175,000 personnel. We would have to go into the Navy and take out one of the carriers. We would have to go and more ships. We would have to go into the Air Force, for example, and take out more platforms. So for example, the KC-10, um, just to list one example. We would also have to go into the modernization accounts and cut those much more deeply, which we think would put at risk our ability to keep pace with A2AD developments, for example we would have much more significant readiness problems, both in the near term and the long term, if we go back to sequestration level cuts. So all of those things in combination, I think, would have a very damaging impact on our strategy, on, on all of the pillars. So for example, in terms of protecting the homeland against potential strikes, particularly if we were engaged in a combat operation overseas, our ability to protect the homeland at the same time would be put under strain, again, because of the capacity. Because of capacity challenges under permanent sequestration, it would be harder to build security globally. We would have a harder time generating sufficient forward presence to do all of the partnership activities that we think are necessary around the world. Because of the readiness challenges and the capacity challenges, we would be concerned about our ability to respond rapidly to crises in the way that we'd like to. And because of all three issues, capacity, capability, particularly modernization, and readiness, 
our ability to project power and win decisively would not be as assured as it would be under the PB15 level. So we think it's very important, particularly with Congress, to highlight just exactly what we see as being the results potentially of going back to permanent sequestration. Um, and it's precisely because of these kinds of risks that the President and the Secretary decided to put forward a defense budget that is significantly higher than the BCA level caps. We think that the strategy we've put forward is the right strategy for the country, and we think the additional resources are, are needed and warranted to be able to execute that strategy. So why don't I stop there and join Kathleen at the panel and then look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you very much, Christine, um, for that great overview of the QDR. I think you said it best that the QDR has been undertaken during extremely challenging times, and I say that as somebody who survived many a QDR myself, um, and I certainly don't, uh, uh, don't wish to be in your shoes right now, given the challenges that you faced. Um, Let's start with probably the, the harshest criticism that's been put forward to date, which is by the Hask chairman, Buck McKeon. Representative McKeon has said that he believes, and I'm paraphrasing here, that the QDR 2014 has failed to meet the statutory requirement to produce a, a, a strategy that is at low to moderate risk. Um, and in fact, he's asked that you, um, uh, the department that is, be required to redo the strategy. As indicated, he's going to put in a a requirement either to the NDAA or separately to have you redo the QDR. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on his assessment that the QDR does not put forward a strategy that is low to moderate risk, and of course to the um, wonderful opportunity for you to redo the QDR um, yet again. Heavens. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, it's on? Okay. I think it's just the lights off. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, we're very aware of, of Chairman McKeon's statement about the QDR, and I think I would say a, a couple of things about it. Um, in addition, well, first of all, in the low to moderate risk piece, I think I would say. Again, we believe that at the president's budget level, we've put forward a strategy that allows us, that, that we can execute with our joint force with increased risk in some areas. The secretary has been very clear that he believes we can manage those risks, and I think the service chiefs are comfortable with that statement as well. Part of the issue with low to, I mean, there's a couple of things. One, the strategy is not monolithic. It's obviously there are different parts of the strategy, and some parts of the strategy we can execute at low risk. Other parts of the strategy, I think we would execute at higher risk compared to low risk. And I think that gets into the whole issue of low to moderate to high risk. And this is something the department has, has worked on through uh, any number of QDRs and also in other, in other forums. You know, one, one man or woman's moderate risk is another man or woman's high risk. And so to some extent, you know, it's a very subjective, um, set of adjectives. I, our view is that we can manage the risks at the PB15 level. I think it's fair to say, based on the characterization of what we think permanent sequestration would do to the strategy, that at that level, we would, we, it would be higher risk, and it would be certainly moderate to high risk, and it would be, I mean, the, the secretary has gone so far as to, to characterize the sequestration level risk as unacceptable risk to our national security. So I think we'd certainly been, be in agreement there. We believe we've met the requirements of the statute. I also wanted to address a couple of other, I think the chairman's um, critique had three parts. One part was the low to moderate risk. He also um, critiqued us as being exclusively budget driven. And, and then his third criticism was that we were um, only looked out five years as opposed to 20 years, which is what is required by the statute. Our view is that, that this was like other QDRs that the department has undertaken was a strategy driven but resource informed document. And as, as 
illustrations or evidence to that, I would point to a couple things. First, the very first thing the department did as the start of this QDR was to assess the security environment. That was really the first important piece. We did that in order to determine what are the strategic objectives that we should be pursuing. And as part of that assessment of the security environment, we looked out 20 years. We tried to look out even farther than that. We, we drew, among other things, on the National Intelligence Council's Global Trends 2030. Um, we also looked out 20 years in terms of thinking about the kinds of investments, the kind of capabilities that the force needed. So the, the QDR does have a force table uh, well into the document that has a five-year time frame. That has a five-year time frame because, of course, the planning window that the department uses to develop force structure is a five-year time frame. So that part of the QDR does have a five-year time frame, but the overall review very much had a 20-year time frame. And I would say, again, that the overall review was strategy-driven. I think the secretary has pointed out that um, you know, he's, he's working on the real business of conducting and protecting our national security. And to develop a strategy completely disconnected from the resource picture is more of a graduate seminar exercise of, as opposed to trying to figure out what we really should be doing and how we really should be developing our force going forward. So our, our view is that strategy driven and resource informed is what you need to do to develop a joint force that actually allows you to execute a strategy. Very good. Um, let's talk a little bit about the sequester level, if that should come to pass um, across the fit up and what that does to the strategy. The language um, in the document, and I think reflective of what you've said here today, is that risk is increased um, at the above BCA levels, and I'm assuming that means increased over the 2012 DSG? Is that what increased it, it, means? Well, it's even increased over the, to the extent that um, the current updated strategy at the president's budget level has some increased risk associated with it. Sequestration yeah. would be increased above and beyond yes, that. Yes, right. It risks okay. rise significantly oh, with yeah. sequestration. It was the increased risk, increased over what? That was the first part, um, which, which that's helpful. Um, so, you know, you, you point to this in your remarks today that it, it, with this risks that rise significantly with sequestration, for a strategist that certainly brings to mind what do you do about the strategy and, you know, the question that all strategists' minds are how, how far do you thin that strategy and increase that risk and when do you decide that the strategy itself, meaning the objectives and the ways, need to fundamentally be relooked. Where are you on uh, inside the department? Um, how are you thinking about that, that potentiality of sequester, some might say a likelihood of sequester being in place, at least sequester level cuts being in place across the fit up, um, and the need to relook the strategy fundamentally in its objectives and in its ways? That's a great question. I think our view was um, certainly going into the QDR, we, uh, a couple of things. I would start by saying, um, we believe that it is in the interests of the United States to continue to be able to play a leadership role in the international community, and that it's important to have a strategy that allows us to do that. We believe the updated strategy we've put forward is that kind of strategy that allows us to do that. And I think part of what we're trying to do in this QDR report is to help a variety of audiences understand just how serious the threats of sequestration are to being able to play that role. Our view, I think our assessment at this time, is that we need to continue to try to talk to our audiences and work together to try to find a solution to the sequester mechanism. We did get the, the Balanced Budget Act, the Ryan Murphy Act, did give the department some much needed relief, particularly in 14, much less in 15. But I think we want to try to focus on partnering with those in Congress who share the interest in protecting the, the national security interests of our country to try to find a solution. Eventually, you know, again, um, particularly as someone who's recently gone through a confirmation hearing, a good answer is always not to speculate on a hypothetical. So I'm going to largely try to stick to that. But I would say, you know, and I would say this to Congress and to the American people, you can't live in a mansion if you're working on a middle-class salary. 
So at a certain point, we are going to have to ask ourselves, you know, what kind of nation do we want to be and what kind of role do we want to play? And, and being a global leader does not come cheap. So I think, you know, we're not ready to get to that point yet. But I don't think that you can, and this is something I don't think I said it when I was standing at the podium, while our strategy does have a significant theme of innovation, we are not putting that forward as sort of a silver bullet or a panacea to be able to solve our fiscal issues. You know, there, certainly the department should and can do more to operate more efficiently and operate more creatively. However, I at least am of the view that we don't have, that changing the ways we execute our strategy, um, you can't get all the way there. That alone will not solve the problem that we would face if confronted with permanent sequestration level cuts. Thank you, and your, your, um, your great analogy about the mansion on the middle class income, I think upends the entire premise of reality television and personal finance <laughs> philosophy that goes with it. Um, There's but no one willing to, I mean, uh, that, you know, assuming no one's willing to give you a bunch of loans, look, hopefully we learned <clears throat> something from the housing right. bubble crisis. But let's follow on this point you're making about um, innovation, and, and I definitely take your point on it. It won't get you all the way there, but there is a heavy emphasis both in the DSG and now in this QDR with trying to find innovative approaches to balance the books as best as possible or, and also to overcome true challenges, military, <clears throat> excuse me, and technological challenges that the United States faces in different regions of the world. What's sort of the implementation plan? You gave some examples, particularly the bilateral co cooperation with the Brits. What are sort of the implementation pathways now that you have the report out the door in trying to find some of these areas for innovation and press them forward within the department? Mm -hmm. Well, we have a number of different things. Um, as I said, we have sort of a pretty robust program with the Brits and the Australians to try to pursue both um, sort of deeper cooperation on the planning front and on the operational front. We are also, uh, we, we have been in the process and are continuing in the process. We have sort of a blueprint of cooperation laid out with some of our partners in the Gulf region, for example. In that area, we are, we are focused on trying to work with them to, um, to invest more in capabilities that we think will be particularly helpful to them. For example, integrated air and missile defenses, uh, maritime security capabilities, cyber capabilities. We're very focused on working with countries in that region to try to invest in those kind of, to some extent, uh, meat and potatoes capabilities, capabilities that perhaps kind of aren't as bright and shiny as some of the other types of capabilities they might invest in, but we think will actually do more to sort of help strengthen the foundation of their ability to contribute to their own security. Um, looking to Asia Pacific, we're pursuing a similar kind of um, agenda of cooperation. Again, really focusing on investing in some of the very basic capabilities with Taiwan, for, ex for example, investing in some very basic capabilities um, to help them contribute to their own self-defense. So that's part of the program. I think, you know, we'll continue through the, through the war plan review process to look at how we, you know, are we really pushing out there? Even in that area, I would say, however, you know, I think there is quite a bit of room to be more innovative. Um, but in some cases, even though we may need to relook some of our fundamental concepts, that doesn't, again, necessarily mean that the kinds of capabilities that we might need to execute some new concepts are going to be inexpensive. So I think that's part of the challenge that we have. Very good. And let me ask one more question before I turn it over to the audience, and that's um, the Hill. <clears throat> I think it's evident to everybody in Washington, and certainly in your comments, it seems clear that the department understands as well that the, the, the greatest partner the department can have in moving forward with this strategy and this budget are th those partnerships it can build on the Hill. What is the, a, a pathway, the approach way that you all have decided to take over the next, say, four to five months to try to create the kind of um, partnership you need to get through the budget you require to execute this strategy? Mm -hmm. Well, again, I'm not sure we have a silver bullet in that area. I think we are just trying to continue to have the conversations that we've been having to some extent, but I think the QDR amplifies those um, points that we're trying to make. We, we have very much said to the Congress that 
Um, for example, this budget builds in already. It assumes that we're going to be able to get the savings. It, it, we, we, for example, we've asked for another BRAC round in 2017. We've obviously asked for this whole set of compensation reform proposals. And if we are not able to get those reforms through Congress, we will have to go back into the budget and find those savings in equipment, in end strength, in readiness, places where we don't want to go. And I think what we're trying to do with the Hill is build coalitions of members who understand the importance of being able to get these types of reforms through. It is an upward climb. We are under no illusions of that, particularly in an election year. Um, base closure is absolutely essential for the department. We have excess infrastructure already that we are paying for that is not contributing to our national security. So, you know, again, I don't think we have a, a magic new argument, but part of what we're trying to do is be very honest and transparent about the risks that we face. You know, to some extent in the past six months, the Hill has said to us, show us what will happen, show us what will happen, help us understand what sequestration really does. And I think we are making progress, at least based on some of the briefings that I've done. And I, I don't see the Hill as necessarily as much as many in the department. I think we are starting to make progress in terms of making clear what the consequences are. Um, but again, you know, we're, we're a piece of a broader picture. And there are a lot of cross-cutting currents that have to be waded through to get to a solution. Okay, very good. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have microphones that go around the room. If you can raise your hand, wait for the microphone to come if I call on you, and I need your name and affiliation. So right here. Thank you, Richard Burton from the British Embassy. Um, I wanted to take your mind back to when Secretary Hagel was speaking, I think, in this room just before Christmas, and he set out some of the rebalances that you then addressed in the QDR. Um, specifically around uh, the capability and capacity balance and also between the services. And I wondered if you could characterize for us how far down that road of rebalancing, particularly on protecting modernization uh, and looking at capacity and also between the services, you think you've come in this QDR or the extent to which uh, it's an iterative process and you have some way to go. Thank you. Sure, happy to talk about that. Um, <clears throat> I think one... One thing that became clear as we went through the QDR process was the fact that um, it, there's not a one-size-fits-all balance in terms of capacity, capability, and readiness, for example. You know, the, the Army's capability to some extent is largely, you know, is significantly resident in its capacity, whereas a, a, another service like the Air Force may be more sort of characterized by its capability, by, by the platforms themselves. So to some extent, I think it's important to not sort of think about it in an overly monolithic way. I think in terms of the choices that we've made through this QDR and budget process, we feel like the types of rebalancing decisions that the Secretary has put forward would, would provide us a joint force overall that would be in balance and that would have the right attributes to be able to fulfill the strategy. Um, I'd stop there. Me. Not using my own rules, right up here in the front row. <clears throat> I'm Andre Sovizo, and I'm the uh, chief representative in Vietnam for a company in Detroit that's manufactured a maglev train and in the DNC Presidential Partners Program. Now, um, my question, wonderful presentation and reassuring. And, and so in East Asia, um, as I'm sure you well know, the, the various countries like the Philippines, Vietnam, and, and further north, Japan, they're kind of assessing how credible is our ability to deter continued use of violence and maybe worse violence in the future by China, even as we try to build a... So I, it sounds from what you've said that we have a... Without sequestration, we have the assets, we're building the assets to be able to manage the relationship with China, and hopefully they opt for peaceful coexistence. Um, but my question is this, are you also thinking about or working on, other than the wonderful things you said about working with the Congress and all, um, are you also thinking of ways to make our commitment a little more conspicuous than 
that because most of those people, they're not going to be sitting in a wonderful session like this. And uh, make it a little more clear. For example, why not, as it's just one small example, why not lift the embargo against the export of lethal weapons to Vietnam instead of letting Russia supply them all? And that's my question. Thank you for that question. It's very nice to get a question about that region um, that has inherent in it recognition that we're not, uh, that, the, that the rebalance strategy, frankly, is not a contained China strategy. So thank you for that. As you said, our, our goal is to, is to, what we would like to see is to see China join the international community as a cooperative um, partner in that community. In terms of sort of making the rebalance more visible, you know, I think we're, um, trying to take those, we are trying to take steps to do that very thing. You know, for example, we've been deploying the LCS in Singapore. We are also putting a joint high-speed vessel into the region. By 2020, we will have 60 percent of our naval ships deployed into the Asia-Pacific region. We've put a huge focus on, and it's not just platforms. I mean, we in the department think about the rebalance as being focused on strengthening our alliances and partnerships, on strengthening our forward posture and presence in the region. So, for example, with the, the work we're doing with Australia to have the Marines be in Darwin, that's, I think, a very tangible expression of our commitment to the region. We are still on track to be able to have 2,500 Marines there in a few more years. Um, we are also, though, very engaged in terms of senior leader visits. Secretary Hagel has gone to the region a number of times. He'll be going back out to the region this spring in April. We have done a, a large number of exercises in the region in port visits and things of that nature. So I think we are very focused on uh, making our interest and commitment to that region tangible sort of across a wide spectrum of activities platforms, posture. We're in, the, we're in discussions right now with the Philippines about greater access to that country, for example. So there's a lot of activity in that area. That said, certainly I'm well aware that there's um, concern in the region about whether we will be able to sustain the rebalance. We hear those messages as well, and part of why we're as engaged talking to countries in that region is to assure them that even in the face of some greater fiscal austerity than we've seen in the past decade, we are very committed to that region and to being re continuing to remain a Pacific power. Okay. Um, thank you. I'm Jennifer Chen with Shenzhen Media Group of China. A uh, couple of questions, if I may. Um, with the tight budget of this year, is there any concern from U.S. government that Japan will resort and self-help to develop nuclear weapon? If there's no concern, uh, what is the reason uh, from U.S. to press Japan to give back the plutonium? And what's your expectation about the nuclear summit at Hague? Thank you so much. Thank you. Why don't I can really only, since this is a... Um, a discussion about the quadrennial defense review, and I am, I'm the DUSD for strategy, plans, and forces. I can't speak to the sort of last two questions that you asked, but I, but I can certainly try to speak to the first one. I think our view is we are very, um, as I said, committed to the Asia-Pacific rebalance. We are, our alliance with Japan is very, very strong. We are committed to reassuring the Japan and the region. And, and our view is that there, there's not a need for any kind of nuclear capability as long as our alliance remains strong, which we believe it is. Let me just to quickly ask a follow-up. In the QDR deliberations, or as you looked at the security environment, did this general concept that there might be nations who, as the U.S., um, reduces its spending or did anything that was seen as withdrawing in key regions of the world to include East Asia. Was there any kind of direct assessment of the likelihood of proliferation? I would say it was probably more of a subtext than an explicit conversation. I, certainly, I think particularly, you know, part of what we did through the QDR process was um, particularly, for example, when it came to assessing the sufficiency and proficiency of the joint force in the future, we looked at what we what we call the alt palm force which was you know as some of you may know the services put forward kind of sequester level forces um, so as we went through the process we were we were uh, looking at sort of the implications to our strategy of a variety of different budget levels and certainly at the lowest levels i think there was an implicit understanding that the risks of that kind of 
proliferation or the risks of countries that are scientifically capable enough to develop their own nuclear program, which certainly Japan is, would go up. But it wasn't an explicit factor. Okay, good. Let's see. Um, let's go all the way to the left over there. Thanks. Uh, Kate Brandon with Politico. Could you discuss the disconnect between DOD's stated policy, uh, an army of 450,000 soldiers and an 11 carrier fleet, and what's actually funded in the five-year um, spending plan, and why didn't the Pentagon use the extra $115 billion to fund these priorities? Thanks. Sure. Uh, I would largely refer you to the comments that Comptroller Bob Hale has made, but, but let me reiterate um, a couple of things. First. Uh, particularly when it comes to the Army, making those kinds of reductions in end strength is a, is a process that takes a while. It takes a lot of planning. Same thing for the carrier in terms of ultimately decommissioning it. And our assessment at the time, given the level of uncertainty, the department's assessment was that we needed to at least plan for those lower levels in our budget to ensure that we had enough time to execute that were it to become necessary. The, um, the way we would address it in terms of ensuring if we get a signal from Congress over the next several months that they are going to budget at higher levels than the BCA cap level, we would go back in in the 16 cycle and make some, you know, we would move some things around, take some money out of some of the modernization accounts, for example, for example minor procurement and reorient that funding to enable us to be able to, to continue to fund the Army at 450, for example, or the 11th carrier. And to that effect, the, the acting deputy secretary has put out a memo to the services directing them to be prepared to do that kind of planning in the next budget cycle, again, if we get indications from Congress that they are going to support funding us at a higher level. Okay, we have just a few minutes left, so what I'm going to do is take a, a couple of questions together, which um, I'm going to ask be questions and not statements, so that um, Ms. Wormuth has an uh, optimum chance to answer any and all that she can in there. So I'm going to just sweep the room over here to the right. Jordana Mishori with Inside the Pentagon. I know the 2012 strategic guidance talks about reversibility when it comes to the Army, but the QDR doesn't necessarily. I was wondering, how do you plan to accomplish that? Okay, thanks very much. And there was one right here, uh, Reese, right here. Um, thank you very much. Michael Sveda from the Embassy of the Czech Republic. Uh, my question um, uh, concerns the current situation in Ukraine. Don't you think that the, the current developments in Ukraine constitute a kind of significant change of the security environment, global security environment? And don't you think this should be uh, reflected in the, in the QDR to, uh, to make it a real strategy that reflects the current situation? Thank you very much. Okay, very good. Let's see. Uh, right behind you, ma'am, right here. I don't think he's asked. Thank you. Uh, my name is Frank Barone. I'm an independent investor, so I'd like to talk to you for a moment about some of the issues we see on the investment side. Uh, we certainly, from the outside, look at this as being the legal boundaries, and so we have a question that says the law of the land is sequestration, which we are all aware of. Uh, we would expect, as an external investor, that there would be something in the FY15 plan that's going to assume that you're going to have to abide by that law, regardless of all the deviations you've mentioned, which we understand. I don't know that we see that. The second thing I'd like to commend and ask a question for you is I notice a lot of coalition activity that you're talking about, and I commend you on the UK. We have some outstanding models which have already been developed in the Middle East, as you pointed out, with integrated air and missile defense. We also have in the Department of Energy some good correlations with what we're doing with Canada on energy. What do we need to do from your perspective to open up FMS for you so that you can enable those resources to make those relationships happen, particularly between our, our partners like the UK? Great. Okay, and one more. Let's go right here. Thank you, Warner Anderson. I work in the Defense Department. Um, Secretary Gates, Secretary Panetta, and uh, Secretary Clinton have all spoken extensively on smart power. I didn't see it in the QDR. I didn't see it specifically mentioned. Um, yet it's in the QDDR. I'm wondering if there's a gap. I haven't heard much from... from uh, the current secretary about it. So is that a, a, an important consideration? 
Okay, so Christine, we have reversibility, Ukraine, um, sequestration as the law of the land, A, and then B, FMS reform. And then at every CSIS event, we must pay a questioner to ask about the CSIS registered trademark of smart power. So that is your final question. Over to you. Uh, a bunch of great questions. Uh, let me talk first about sort of the law of sequester. Um, you know, I think people have talked about, and certainly the press has written about, how this is a very complicated budget that we've put forward, and certainly the QDR, you know, speaks to that complicated budget. Part of, I think, what we're trying to do in this um, complicated environment was to um, recognize the, the fact that sequester, that the Budget Control Act is the law of the land. Certainly, we did, um, for 15, basically submit a budget that is compliant with that budget. Part of the reason that we put forward the $26 billion Opportunity Growth and Sustainment Initiative was because um, at the BCA or the BBA, excuse me, 15 levels, we really could use that additional $26 billion to be able to get over the hump to, to fully execute the strategy as we'd like to in FY15, for example. But so part of what we're trying to do is recognize the fact that, yes, the Ryan Murphy Act passed, but you know, what happens in the future is still to be determined. And what we are trying to articulate is that we believe to execute a strategy commensurate with our role as a global leader, we need more resources than, than we have right now under the law. Um, you know, we are putting forward as a department a written product that describes how we would budget at sequestration levels. Again, I think to indicate that we have undertaken some significant planning at the sequestration levels, but we don't feel that accepting those sequestration levels in the future is what's right for the country. So that's how I would speak to that. Um, bouncing over to reversibility of the Army, that's a great question. I think, you know, you might have noticed, um, some of you who've read the report, so this is how I can tell who's really serious about reading QDRs, in the chairman's assessment, he talks about the need to do a year-long study really looking at that very issue, and I think looking in detail at mechanisms to increase our ability to revert, uh, the, to increase sort of our reversibility factor, for example, I think we do need to do some more detailed homework on that. You know, there's a, a number of different ways that you can try to um, handle the, the size of the army. One, one is, you know, if we were to be involved in a large scale conflict, we could um, depart from the optimal bog dwell ratios, for example, and for a period of time potentially go to longer deployments than just a year, for example. We also need, however, to find ways to access the reserve component more quickly and to be able to train up the reserve component forces more quickly than we have in the past. So I think that is a homework assignment coming out of the QDR, but it's an important one and one I think that the department has taken on board. Um, Smart power, you know, I think uh, it's true that we don't have the phrase smart power anywhere in the QDR, but I think we very much embrace the concept of that. We do talk in the QDR report at some length about the fact that the military is just one tool in the national security toolkit, and we very much see ourselves as part of developing whole of government solutions to security challenges. So we've, we very much see ourselves as needing to partner with our colleagues in the diplomatic core, in the development part of the government, partnering with folks in Treasury, for example, and USTR, that putting all of those tools together, I think, to try to apply our, our power effectively is very much, I think, um, implicit throughout the QDR and is a big part of how we think about doing partnership um, building activities, for example. Going to um, Ukraine, I think I would say as a strategist that um, certainly when you develop a strategy, you want it to be flexible enough um, and, and not too overdetermined because you want it to be able to adapt to real world events that you can't necessarily predict. And I would argue that particularly two of the, of the strategic pillars in the updated QDR strategy, building security globally and projecting power, are very much applicable to the situation that we see going on in Europe right now. We are, and the report talks at some length about, about our commitment to protecting Euro-Atlantic stability, to working with our NATO allies, to being able to um, do things like reinforce the aviation detachment in Poland, for example, to beef up our commitment to the Baltic air policing, 
So, um, and we have, we believe, under this strategy and under the president's budget request level of funding, the forces we need, I think, to be able to put forward a full range of military options for any number of situations if the secretary and the president were to want that. So, so I don't think that the Ukraine situation requires sort of a wholesale redo of the strategy. I think our strategy is sort of broadly broadly envisioned and is and would allow us to do the kinds of things that we need to do to both support the government of Ukraine but also reassure our NATO allies um, in terms of the situation that's happening on the ground. Well, um, I, we're going to bring this portion of our event to a close. Um, Christine, I'm delighted to host you here back in your old home, you. new old okay. home. Um, and it, it's just incredible to have someone of your caliber um, working inside government. We're so grateful to have you here. Um, and five years, I think, strong in this, <laughs> in this uh, latest stint in government, in addition to your career time as a civil servant. So we really appreciate you taking the time to explain the QDR. We're going to um, uh, uh, have you uh, exit now so you can get on with your busy day. And then if you all will stay in your place, we'll move up our panel. So thank you very much. Thank you all. All right, may I have your attention, please? That's a polite way of saying it's time for you to stop talking. Thanks. Uh, I also want to welcome our viewers on the web. Uh, it's an increasing capability that we depend upon here to be able to reach folks who might not live and uh, be able to get to this zip code. Um, and uh, in keeping with that, when we get to our question period, I'll invite those of you who are on the web to send a question by email. And uh, if I like them, I'll ask them. But, uh, or maybe, maybe I'll ask them even if I don't like them, depending on who they're directed to. Um, also, I'd like to remind you to silence your cell phones if you're in the room here with us. I'm David Berto. I'm the Senior Vice President and the Director of our National Security Program on Industry and Resources. Uh, and it's a great privilege and a pleasure to be able to follow uh, Christine Warmuth and her discussion and her response to the questions as well. Uh, however, it's our belief that there are still a few unexplored and unanswered questions that remain to be looked at today. Um, I have a great panel here with me. I have only one slide that I'd like to put up. If you're watching on the web, you should be able to download this slide in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, and if our new technical capability actually works, you may even be able to see it uh, when I call it up. Of course, those of us in the room won't actually know if this is happening or not. But So I'm going to click to it here on the, uh, on the screen uh, here in the room. This is a laydown of what we know and what we suspect. So there are, on the left-hand side, just two lines. Uh, the, these are the enacted budget levels for fiscal years 12, 13, and 14. At the bottom, kind of the red line with little spots of blue dashed in it, is the base budget. 
and at the top, kind of the green for, uh, for deployed, if you will, is uh, the base budget plus the Overseas Contingency Operation Fund, or OCO. That's for 12, 13, and 14. Then when you get to 15, which is the line kind of in the middle of the chart, you diverge and you have three different numbers, if you will. The very bottom, the dashed red line, is the $496 billion base budget laid out last week by the Defense Department, described just a few minutes ago by Secretary Wormuth as uh, compliant with the Revised Budget Control Act or the Bipartisan Budget Act or the Murray-Ryan or Ryan-Murray Act, whatever you want to call it, that number, $496 billion. The next number, the blue line, and DOD has now gone to red line, blue line, um, that is the total budget, if you will, in the base budget that includes the $26 billion in the Opportunity Growth and Security Initiative, or the OGSI, as we are affectionately referring to it. And then at the top is the notional line, because we don't actually know the Overseas Contingency Operation Fund level for FY15 yet. We won't know that until we know what the final disposition of our Afghanistan presence is. But the placeholder that DOD is using now is $79 billion. And so that number right at about $600 billion is the $522 billion plus the $79 billion of the total budget proposal as we know it today. Then to the right, we get into the projection land. So this is more what we suspect, if you will. Again, the dashed red line at the bottom, that is the line set in the law, as was referred to earlier by Mr. Marone, I think, right? That, this is the law. Um, I would note that the Budget Control Act uh, was passed in August, actually passed July 31st, signed August 2nd, 2011, but it ha and it has been the law of the land, but it has changed twice. And each time it changed, it changed on the very eve of its implementation. And so to assume that the law is going to stay the law, historically says, has not happened. But to assume that you know when it's going to change or how it's going to change, historically, we don't have a clue. All right? So those are, those are important considerations, I think, to keep in mind here. Nonetheless, DOD has made it clear that it needs more than that. And that's the blue line. We know it's in the $26 billion. The services have pretty much laid that out. Uh, and a lot of it is readiness, and a lot of it is what uh, Secretary Bill Perry referred to back in the uh, early days of the post-Cold War era as long-term readiness, meaning modernization, procurement, and investment in RDT&E. Um, what we don't know is what's in that $115 billion uh, between the blue line and the red line for 16, 17, 18, and 19. Uh, we have some idea of what the totals are. We don't have the service-by-service service breakout. We're not quite sure what would be included in that, uh, in that number, if you will. We also have a placeholder for OCO of about $30 billion a year. We have no idea what that number would lay out, if you will. So this raises, uh, in many ways, more questions than it answers, if you will. Um, will the OCO be the escape hatch or the safety valve for the Congress in FY15? What kinds of signals would DOD need to have uh, that Secretary Wormuth referred to earlier that would allow it to begin to plan for a number above, at, or perhaps even below the uh, revised Budget Control Act caps? Uh, what constitutes unacceptable risk and what would be the nature of the fix to resolve those? There are a host of questions that we could raise here. Um, fortunately, I don't have to answer those questions. I have with me uh, four of the best minds in, in Washington, uh, all of whom happen to reside here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm, I'm going to turn to them. Here's kind of the process that we're going to use to follow. I've asked each of them to provide some commentary on their own. Uh, we're going to start at my left and work down the table for about five minutes or so. Then we're going to first uh, offer the opportunity for each of them to ask one another questions. Uh, one or two of those. I actually have one in mind already, but I havenven't told them what it is yet. And, uh, and then we're going to th throw the floor open for uh, questions from the audience and questions, of course, from our, our viewers on the web. So first, uh, I'm going to introduce them all, and then we'll just go, go down the line. To my immediate uh, left, to your right, if you're looking on, is uh, Dr. Clark Murdoch. Dr. Murdoch is a uh, senior advisor and the director of both our Defense National Security Group and our project on, national, uh, on nuclear initiatives. He is also directly responsible for recruiting me to CSIS some 13-plus years ago. 
Uh, you'll notice we fixed almost every problem that was in existence back then, and now we have new ones. Uh, next is Dr. Maren Lead, who is a senior advisor and is uh, part of the Harold Brown Chair on Defense Policy Studies. Uh, then to her left is uh, Stephanie Sanat Castro, a senior fellow here in the International Security Program. And then to the far end of the table, Sam Brannon, also a senior fellow at the International Security Program. So I'll turn the floor over to each of them in turn. Dr. Murdoch. Uh, thank you. I've <clears throat> been involved in just about every QDR there's been. I'm, in fact, involved in QDRs before there were QDRs. Uh, Bottom-up review, uh, Secretary Aspen's first one, then there was the exchange over uh, Colin Powell's base force. Uh, and I want to say, from a personal perspective, you know, there is something very, very much unique about this QDR. It packs quite a wallop, and I can speak to that in a personal sense. I've taken punch after punch, uh, and I'm here bearing the bruises from taking on this particular QDR, and that'll be my last uh, punchline from that one as well. Um, there's just two comments I want to make about uh, this QDR. Um, the first thing is, is that despite what Chairman McKeon said, uh, this QDR did exactly what it had to do, and that is to address the sequester and the fiscal crisis. People recall back in the 2005-2006 QDR, it pretended that the war in Iraq wasn't going on and was heavily criticized for it. A QDR has to take on the most pressing defense challenges and security challenges facing the department at that time. And there is no question that the challenge that is facing this department <coughs> is how to sustain a strategy, one that has deep roots uh, in uh, pr this administration and previous administrations, how to sustain it under increasingly dire fiscal circumstances. Uh, I've been working on a project here at CSIS, we call it the Affordable Military, which is a word that appeared a lot in this QDR and in the budgetary documents about what is affordable. When we look at the current trend lines, and that is of the budget coming down under the sequester caps or under the Budget Control Acts, and of the internal cost growth, the internal inflation brought on by about 7% per year increase of the cost of personnel, pay, benefits, O&M, uh, and acquisition, by the time you get out to 2021, which is the last year of the sequester of the Budget Control Act, you almost have no money for modernization. You have a trade-off that if you want to restore modernization to the typical 32 percent that it consumes the defense budget, you have to give up 560,000 people in end strength. That's a trade-off, and those are huge trade-offs. And I don't think we've quite, uh, in the community, but I don't think the department either has quite come to grips with how severe these trade-offs are between continuing to do business the way we do business today, the internal cost growth of and exacerbated by the drawdown that we are now engaged in. This QDR and I think the budget request that accompanies the FY15 budget request is starting to recognize that reality and coming to deal with it, but it is the crisis. We can't talk about 2020 until we know what we're going to look like at the end of the Budget Control Act during that time. Uh, the second comment I wanted to make is, uh, again, a brief one. Uh, I'm troubled by the word rebalance. Uh, I'm particularly troubled when it's taken from one area and then applied to several other areas as well. Uh, but I'm also troubled by rebalance seems to indicate that there is a balance out there, that there is some kind of natural, you know, reading that we're going to go to, that the rheostat will go back to where it's supposed to be. Um, there isn't a natural balance. Uh, there is lots of different distortions we can do to ourselves and have done to ourselves as part of this drawdown uh, that's coming. And so I'm concerned that when I look at the underlying strategy back in, um, in the 2010 QDR, I think the phrase was used, we want to maintain capabilities against a wide range of contingencies. And then Currently, it is capabilities against a full spectrum of conflict. 
and this is the underlying thing, we've got to be prepared across the board to sustain global leadership. Well, that's not setting priorities. If you're trying to prepare for the widest possible contingency, range of contingencies, you may just spread yourself thin enough so that you're not adequately prepared for any of them. And so it strikes me that while we want to sustain leadership, we also, when we use the words as is used in the current QDR, we are going to be selective and tailored in the way we engage with the use of the military. You can't prepare for everything and then be selective and tailored on how you engage. So I think we have to make more hard choices about what we're going to do and what we're not going to do and not prepare for the things we're not going to do. Dr. Lee. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, thanks all, for all of you for coming today. It's great to see so many familiar faces in the audience. Um, and Kath, thanks for bringing you know, Secretary Warmoth here. Um, I am somewhat uh, reluctant to be critical of, of what the department has done because I uh, both sympathize and empathize with the challenge that they had. I remember when they started this, uh, the endeavor of the QDR, um, it was very hard for me to conceive of how you even took the task on of designing a strategy when you didn't know how much money you had. Um, so they, you know, made up some numbers that they wish they had, and, and hopefully, hopefully that's that'll be the way it pans out. Although I think we've uh, had discussions and we'll continue to have them about how likely that is. But um, and one of the things I found most intriguing in the whole document was the statement that it reflects the bipartisan budget act but it doesn't accept sequestration levels thereafter. And so I wonder if that was some sort of executive privilege or something like that, and what, how available that is to the rest of us as citizens, whether I can just pick laws that, <laughs> that I can ignore, but I suspect probably it doesn't get all the way to me, unfortunately. But um, I, I just want to make a couple quick remarks about sort of the ends, ways, means of the strategy as I see it. Um, the QDR, in my mind, does a, does a pretty good job of describing the world um, in, in, in all of its complexity. In my mind, uh, it undersells and or under appreciates a couple important dimensions. Um, I could only find one real discussion point about urbanization in the document, um, and that was in the context of climate change. To me, the challenges that urbanization poses to the operational environment and the capabilities associated with that are significant and very much uh, underplayed in this document. I also think the strategy very much favors nation states and. Uh, that's a traditional bias of the department, sort of well acknowledged. Um, but I, th I think, again, it, it uh, does not give su sufficient weight to the, the equally challenging and, and I would argue, uh, more likely uh, and not lesser included case of dealing with very messy uh, non-state, again, highly likely to be very urban. Uh, challenges. So if it's if it's a barbell, we've only treated really one end of the barbell. Uh, on the ways part of the equation, it's obviously, as I think Secretary Warmoth acknowledged, uh, relies very heavily on both prevention and deterrence by others and by us. Um, I think on with others, there's a relatively small set of countries right now that have sufficient uh, ca capability and capacity to contribute in any significant way to that. And while we are certainly have a strategy to try to build that, that takes some time. And a lot of the people, a lot of the nations that we are able to rely on right now, uh, and particularly ones that we've, uh, that have um, developed capabilities in the last decade or so, it's been, it's been a 10 to 20 year process to get them to where they're dealing with their own uh, threats in, in really positive, constructive ways. And so, uh, again, I think that's a, there's a time dimension to that challenge that is um, perhaps not as explicitly acknowledged in the document as it might be. I also think um, for, for the U.S. component of that strategy, I view it principally as, as capability, uh, capacity, and will. And if you look at it in those three, th three dimensions, our capability is uh, declining, particularly if you think about it in a readiness context, our capacity is clearly falling. And there's a huge question about will. Um, and so uh, if those three aspects together, um, I think we're not necessarily um, dealing as explicitly as we could about uh, what, what that does to our ability to prevent and deter. Um, and then with respect to means, again, 
clearly a much more articulate and clear um, discussion of what sequestration uh, would mean for the department. Um, but as we've talked about a little bit already today, it doesn't say what we would do from a strategic perspective if the law stands. And so to some extent, I guess I, I see it as a perpetuation of the chess game with the Defense Department remaining as a pawn in that game. Um, so I'm not sure that we've uh, done much in that, in that means part of the calculation. So in my mind, there are, there are big questions still out there about the roles of the active and the reserve components. Um, we, again, we talked a little bit about the how of innovation. What does that really, what does that really mean? Um, and then I think there are questions about special operations forces and general purpose forces, uh, roles and missions between them, how the special operations component of this evolves over time. Um, reversibility, not just in terms of access to the reserve components, but how much reversibility do we want? How quickly do we need it? Um, so uh, again, we've talked about a lot of that. And then, I, and then with respect to the Ukraine, I was interested that it took until the very last question of the first hour before it would come up. But I think it's much broader than just being able to um, provide some level of forces in them some short period of time. It's a, a question that I think none of us can answer right now about whether the security dynamic in Europe has shifted in a significant way as a result of that. We don't know that yet. But if it has, then um, I think what the QDR alludes to continued force reductions in Europe, and are those still viable uh, in that context? Again, we don't know the answers to those, but I think those are some of the questions still on the table. Thank you. Ms. Castro? <coughs> Thanks, David. Um, David mentioned that I'm a senior fellow in the International Security Program, and at the very end of my brief remarks, I'll talk a little bit about one area of policy that gets me out of bed in the morning, and that's building partnership capacity. And I can give you my sense of reading both the QDR and the budget proposal, um, what I, where I think we're sort of going on building partner capacity. But I'm also dual-hatted here at CSIS. I'm also the acting director for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism. So when I was asked to speak at this event, I wanted to take a close look at the QDR and the budget request from that context. What do they say about Homeland Security? What does it say about um, counterterrorism efforts. And I was pleased to see that the QDR did reflect the very good work that went into the 2012 uh, Defense Strategic Guidance. In that DSG document, they talked about uh, 10 priority areas. Uh, one of them was protecting the homeland, and that has morphed into one of the three pillars of the QDR. So in the, the pillar context, you're, you're looking at protecting the homeland, which will include deterring and defeating attacks on the U.S. and supporting civil authorities uh, against or with countering, um, addressing the effects of either an attack or a natural disaster. The second pillar being building global security, uh, global security, and that's talking about preserving regional stability, deter adversaries, support allies and partners, and talk to them about addressing common security challenges, and that will get me to the BPC piece I want to talk about later. And the third pillar being uh, to project power and win decisively, and that's where, from my perspective, I looked with interest at disrupting and uh, destroying terrorist networks. And so from a Homeland Security counterterrorism perspective, I was very pleased to see in the beginning of the document emphasis on both Homeland and terrorist networks. I, too, was a little bit disturbed, it, whereas reversibility was the key word for the, the uh, DSG two years ago, um, rebalancing and its fuzzy... Uh, interpretation thereof um, was rife throughout this document. And I think reversibility was uh, amended to uh, adaptability, because that also appeared well throughout the document. But on the homeland front, I agree completely with the QDR's take that um, there's an increased likelihood of attack. It doesn't go into what kind of attack. I think when we look at um, the shootings that have occurred over the last few years, um, as well as soft targets, um, smaller attacks, uh, things that, you know, it's always, particularly from a congressional perspective, if they see an event, you know, it's a terrorist attack. Take the Navy Yard example um, from last year. It was a terrorist attack. Will it end up being um, a quasi-insider job? And so I, I would have wished that the QDR talked a little bit more about the range of attacks they're talking about increased likelihood of. It's not the big September 11th, showy um, large-scale attacks. It's really the smaller type. And I, I would really love to, um, to have a conversation with DOD officials when they talk about increased likelihood of attacks. I agree that it takes an active multi-layered approach, uh, maintaining steady state force readiness and a resilient infrastructure. Um, I note 
uh, where the word resilience comes up, it comes up once or maybe twice in the QDR, um, but it is sort of the catchphrase for the natural disaster community as well as um, when you're talking about the psychological effects and other infrastructure effects of terrorist attacks, resiliency comes up quite a bit. And so um, I'm, a, again, a little disappointed that the QDR and the budget, neither one um, really talks about resilience. But then I went a little bit deeper in reading. Um, this is not a QDR, I just scanned like the last QDR, um, I have to admit, um, no offense, Kath. Um, but, you know, looking at what they were considering homeland defense equities, you know, it's limited ballistic missile attacks, nuclear deterrence, cyber deterrence, and with the approval of the president, even um, disruption and denial um, within the cyber realm, <coughs> direct air and maritime attacks, and, and pushing threats beyond the borders. So that was one pillar. Um, the second pillar they talked about, global security, it really was just sort of name the region and what we're trying to do there. It had um, very few specifics. Um, which I found a little bit disappointing um, because if we're trying to, um, as, as Martin sort of said, you take Ukraine as an example, if we're talking about regional stability, I, I would hope that we would have a strategy that could um, flex with that um, a little bit more. And the power projection pillar, and I'm trying to speed this up, David, so you don't cut me off. Um, they talked about it's not just power projection and wind decisively, it's about rebalancing efforts towards building partner capacity, especially in and, and fragile states and working with regional partners to disrupt, dismantle, and defeat Al-Qaeda and its affiliates, other extremist threats, um, remain, remaining vigilant to foreign terrorist organizations and the threats that they pose. So at the end of the day, my takeaways um, from a Homeland Security and Counterterrorism perspective is that the QDR um, paid uh, quite a bit of, of pages and language and whatnot on the Homeland Security and Counterterrorism threats, but without sufficient detail. And I looked to the budget documents, and again, they're merely overview documents at this time, but I found very little to support that, that they're actually putting their money where their mouth is. Uh, I hope that when the department releases uh, more detailed justifications, that I'll be able to see um, and track more closely exactly how they're prioritizing um, my interest areas. Um, but, uh, and the last thing I wanted to say was about building partner capacity. There is one line in the QDR that I welcome everyone to, to question, and it is this. Um, in the, towards the end, when they're talking about Special Operations Forces growing to almost 70,000, um, they talk about the, the unique ability of Special Operations Forces to sustain persistent, networked, distributed operations. Um, I would argue they are not the only element of the U.S. military to be able to do that anymore. Um, that might have been true uh, a few years ago, but I think when you look at new legislative authorities that help with general purpose forces and engaging with local communities, that you will see that um, kind of coming to the fore. The, quest the sentence that I wonder about is, it says, quote, demand for U.S. forces to expand the counterterrorism capabilities of allied or partner forces will likely increase in the coming years. I hate passive sentences. Who's going to increase them? Is it something the combatant commander wants to see? Is it something that the leadership at DOD wants to see? Uh, is it the partner countries who say, well, maybe we can get a piece of uh, American equipment, advice, training? Um, but what is the real there there in terms of have we been able to measure the success of past CT capability um, building? Or, you know, this is one thing that they seem to be hinging a lot on. Demand will increase and therefore soft has to increase as a result. And I, I don't necessarily buy into that. Again, I look forward to documents and justifications to help support that statement. Um, and my last bit, David, is I always consider the chairman's assessment at the end the best part of the QDR. And this year was no exception. Mr. Brandon, so far we've had more questions raised than answered. Um, so you, 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 have, you have five minutes to solve it all. <laughs> good, good. Well, I was, I was going to say, in, in thinking about this, this is the third in a, in a trilogy of defense strategies, the first being Gates' 2010 QDR, Secretary Panetta in 2012, and now Secretary Hagel of 2014. So we will measure them against the Star Wars trilogy. So the first one is the New Hope, then the Empire Strikes Back, and at the end, Skywalker has his hand cut off, sequestration. Turn it over to Secretary Hagel, and we'll see if, if Return of the Jedi occurs in this one. Um, but, but honestly, I think what, what's really interesting is these are three strategies, and they are wartime strategies, only where that war is occurring shifts from Iraq and Afghanistan to essentially Afghanistan 
and now to Afghanistan drawing down, and the principal front really being the, the combat with, with Congress and, and Marin's point about the next move in the, in the chess game. So it's really over to Congress in many ways after this QDR to uh, say how they're going to deal with issues like uh, military compensation, like a, a new round of BRAC, uh, whether they're going to allow Army aviation restructure to occur on the, on the grounds that they put it down on. So this is really, uh, I mean, we're, we're going to see how this, how this plays out in, in coming months and, and weeks, but it's, it's hard to argue that the department hasn't put out a very compelling vision of what the cost of sequestration would be. I mean, with, when, when Secretary Hagel announced the, uh, the FY15 budget about exactly what happens and what else gets cut out uh, at that level, and maybe there's not an articulated strategy, and, and maybe you could argue there should be, but it, but it really is, it is Congress's move now. Um, I think people have, have uh, critics writ large generically have, have talked about disappointment and no big trade-offs made. There wasn't an aircraft carrier traded for anything. There wasn't a huge part of the, uh, the Army traded for anything. So this was a gradual strategy, and I think you heard Under, uh, Deputy Undersecretary Warmoth talk about uh, the, the, the fact that this is evolutionary. It's not revolutionary, and I think it is important to read all of the documents combined, and when you don't find something in this document, uh, it, it probably is one, in one of those previous documents. It just hasn't been highlighted, and I would say there are a lot of useful clarifications in this document. But strategy is really kind of at the margins, because the, the central issue is the resource issue. That's uh, the greatest threat to the United States identified in this QDR is the United States and, and the failure to, to fund uh, the force, and there's a, there's a huge cost, this idea that the U.S. will no longer exert global leadership. So I think it, it's fair to say Ukraine isn't adequately treated in the document, but uh, the United States' ability to, to deal with a range of future Ukraines is addressed in the document. And I think on that, on that level, um, the, this, this other popular uh, discussion point before this QDR this summer was that we're entering an interwar period like we had between World War I and World War II. That analogy could not be more incorrect. I think, if anything, you're seeing continual force demand out for the next 10 years, and that's an environment in which you can't rest, you can't cut back on your forces. If you do, you need a fundamental reset. Um, and I think you, you saw a preview in Syria this summer and in the Middle East uh, today of what happens when the United States steps back from one of these major regional crises. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, not to, not to go into depth on, on that issue, but I, I viewed it at the time as potentially a chance for others in the region to step up. And step up they have, but they've only increased the chaos in the region. So U.S. leadership is, is critical. Um, so finally, a, a few things that I'd mention uh, as maybe missing in this document that, that I would encourage the department to, to flesh out as they do their follow-on internal implementation. Um, I don't feel a lot of jointness in the documents. Uh, I think uh, Clark Murdoch uh, has coined the phrase that if air power is a compound word, it's a political statement, and air power is a compound word here, sea power is two words. Uh, so just looking at little things like that and how the forces are going to work together, um, there's a lot of language that, that doesn't necessarily show an interest in some of the joint lessons learned from the past 10 years of warfare. And that gets to um, a, a Bob Gates quote. I'm, I can't believe I'm the first person to quote Bob Gates on this panel. But the next war-itis uh, is setting in. This idea that the, that the future environment is going to be so different that you're going to need radically different capabilities just is not true. Historically, that's not true, and that's a point Secretary Gates made in a lot of much more articulate ways than, than I did. Um, and, and finally, I think there's a lot of concern stated about sort of 2025 plus and the ability of adversaries to negate U.S. technological uh, edge. Uh, but right now it's just lip service. There's not a lot of specifics on that, and I would point to unmanned systems in particular uh, which, which had sort of a mixed uh, track record across this. Some really good decisions from the Army to, to keep manned unmanned teaming uh, as they uh, draw down their overall uh, attack helicopters uh, and, and bring Apaches into the, into the active uh, and think about how to use some of their existing large inventory of unmanned systems. Um, some, uh, frankly, uh, 
not explicable decisions like the fact that ISR demand is still huge out at the COCOMs, and yet the Air Force is, is cutting down on combat air patrols, even as they convert to an all uh, MQ-9 Reaper uh, ISR fleet. Uh, so just, just a few uh, hanging issues, that's just, just one example, uh, but, but definitely some, some homework to be done. Thank you, Sam. Um, you actually did answer some of the questions there. I appreciate that. Uh, I would invite viewers on the web to uh, send your questions by email. You can send them to me at dbertaau at csis.org. Um, I would like to make a comment and then ask a question to uh, each of the panel members, and, uh, and then we'll open the uh, f floor to additional questions. Um, when we use the word budget, of course, in, in Washington, it really means different things depending on where in the cycle you are. This is the President's budget. It's the budget proposal uh, to the Congress. Uh, the next budget document uh, by law would be the House and Senate budget resolutions. Uh, we have some indication that there will be a House budget resolution. The degree to which it's consistent with or compliant with the Budget Control Act caps uh, remains to be seen. We have some indications that the Senate will actually deem last year's Ryan Murray agreement to be the Senate budget resolution, so they'll set that level. That would then be the basis of allocations uh, under Section 302B of the Budget Reform Act for the appropriators. Uh, more than likely, those allocations would again be consistent with the Budget Control Act uh, caps. DOD, though, has said over the last couple of weeks that this budget they've laid out shows how bad it would be if they had to stay at the cap level, at the sequester level, as they like to call it. So my question to you, it's actually a three-part question, has DOD made the case that this is bad and, and unacceptably bad, if you will, uh, per uh, Secretary Hagel? Can Congress, from all this information, what we've seen so far and what we expect to see, can Congress see clearly the impact of those lower dollars and, uh, and therefore what we would not be able as a nation to do? And if not, what else does DOD need to do to make the case? Um, so, and I would particularly like, uh, you know, three of our panel members here had substantial careers uh, on the Hill before they uh, came to, to CSIS and uh, through the executive branch in some cases. And so I'd particularly like uh, your perspective. But uh, uh, let me throw it open and you can start. Uh, Clark, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, is DOD made a good enough case? Yes. Will Congress see it? No. What else can DOD do? Uh, wait until after the next election. Um, I'll try to be almost as brief. Um, but hopefully more positive and hopeful. Well, no, I don't think I will be. Uh, I, I think DOD has made the best case they can. Um, to me, this gets back to a fundamental challenge of um, there isn't a broad consensus on either the U.S. role in the world um, or on even if people agree on what that role should be, how you best accomplish it. So uh, that the executive branch has laid out its vision of that. It's not broadly accepted. Therefore, I think you're going to continue to have uh, a disconnect in Congress has been shockingly, in my mind, united on both sides of the aisle saying that even though they don't like it, they don't see a way out of PCA. So um, I personally would be surprised if any of that is achieved. So uh, what else can they do? I, I, they can keep talking. I don't think it'll matter. Has DOD made their case? I actually don't think they have. Um, if you look at the entirety of the QDR, they've devoted four pages plus three lines to saying how bad sequestration will be in its own chapter. Now, granted, it's sprinkled how bad sequestration will be throughout the document. Um, but they're not, it's, it's almost like the executive branch and the legislative branch are talking past each other. They don't understand each other's objectives, and neither are willing to meet um, halfway, which means at the end of the day, they're going to get what they get, and then we'll see what the real implications and effects are. Um, what can DOD do more of? Um, I think when you're looking at Congress, they're not entirely believing of the department. When the, the department says something, they don't necessarily think it's true. Um, so more examples, um, getting a, the full range of the, of the DOD support network to, to approach the Hill. It's not just the executive branch. Why don't you bring in some of the associations and others 
um, somehow get them all on the same page and, and talk about it. Um, so no, I, I don't think DOD has made the case because I don't think they understand what Congress is looking for. I have no insight into, into Congress's thinking, but I will, <laughs> I will say on the, on the yeah. DOD side, what, what will probably be helpful is behind the scenes talking to the people who did the, the scenario work and the, and the force planning work and really ran the models that told them that we are on the edge of a cliff, which they, they all strongly believe. And, and to, to be able to articulate how, uh, you know, a Korea scenario stacked against a homeland event stacked across an Iran contingency, how that actually looks and what that does to U.S. forces and what that does with fewer U.S. forces, I think would be a pretty compelling argument. All right, thank you. This is uh, where we'll open it up to the floor. Our procedure, of course, is you raise your hand. Uh, I'll recognize you. You'll have a microphone, which will come to you. I'm going to start at the back and work my way forward. So let's, uh, let's start right here. Identify yourself, please, and your affiliation, and then ask your question. Thanks. Um, hello, I'm Matthew Levinger. I'm the director of the National Security Studies Program at the George Washington University. Um, my question is about procurement reform, um, which doesn't seem to be a hot topic in this QDR. Uh, and specifically, I, I wanted to point to something that uh, David Kilcullen, um, a well-known <laughs> counterinsurgency expert, uh, has talked about in terms of the urbanization of warfare and the emergence of, uh, of megacities. Um, he, has no, he notes that in, I think it's in Syria, there are some of the insurgents patched together um, these little tiny cars, put some armor plating on them, attach them to game, video game consoles and cameras and mounted machine guns on top. So they had for like three or $4,000 a tank that was six feet wide. And so it could, it could navigate in, uh, in the streets of, of environments like that. And my, my concern about procurement is that we seem to be operating under this model where we say, well, in 2022, we'll get the F-35 just right, and here are all the capacities we're going to need in 2022. I mean, Google did not exist 15 years ago, right? I, I mean, so, so how can we be assuming that we will know exactly what capabilities we need um, 10 years out for our major weapon systems? And it seems to me that that one approach to addressing this question would be to come up with cheap, iterative, you know, rapidly adaptable systems. Uh, and I'm just wondering if there, if uh, if you, if the gurus at, at CSIS have given any thought to this issue. Um, I don't know what the gurus think, but uh, uh, we, <laughs> we we actually have a, a, a project underway uh, that will produce some results later this year. That's looking at one variation of the question, not necessarily as it applies to major weapon systems only, Matt, but, uh, but more broadly to DOD. Uh, and that's DOD's ability to identify and then take advantage of technology developments that's occurring in the global commercial arena. Uh, historically, uh, if you look at the, the history of defense technology development over the last 70 years, by and large, it's been focused on stuff that DOD buys and pays for, either directly through R&D contracts or indirectly through investments by major defense firms uh, with the anticipation that DOD will need it. Um, as little as six, seven years ago, the director of DARPA was saying publicly 95 percent of everything he cared about was still being bought and paid for in the defense budget. It's unlikely that that's going to be the case for the foreseeable future, that 95 percent of what DOD cares about is going to be bought and paid for by the defense, unless that's a tautology and we just make it be that way. But the reality is that innovation is occurring all over the place. Uh, these are difficult things for both uh, the Defense Department in particular and the federal government uh, in general to take full advantage of, because we offer such a great deal to uh, any technology innovator who's not already a defense contractor, right? You can. Uh, offer us your uh, equipment and your new technology, and we'll be happy to buy it from you. But of course, you'll have to give us your intellectual property, and then we'll reserve the rights to give that to your competitor when we'd like to compete. Um, you'll have to probably comply with cost accounting standards and Truth in Negotiations Act and a handful of other modest investments in your uh, capacity to uh, do your own bookkeeping. Um, and we'll let you sell it to anybody as long as you apply 
for a license first, then we'll probably say yes, and it may not take us but a year or two. Uh, and so under those circumstances, of course, almost any global commercial company would say, God, I'd love to do business with the government. Please let me have at it. So there are a lot of issues that we've got to wrestle with there, if you will. Applying that, though, to individual weapon systems and, and platforms, I think, is a much, much tougher uh, set of questions. And I think that we will continue to be uh, in, a, in a dual situation where the platforms themselves will evolve at the same slow pace that we've seen in the past. What probably bears more to the question here is modernizations and upgrades inside those platforms and the ability, in fact, to take the Google development that you couldn't see 15 years ago and fold it into the next upgrade. And I think our capability there is actually substantially better uh, than it was in the past, and we're building some of that capability into new systems. So I'm fairly optimistic in that regard. What I'm not all that optimistic about is that we can do it remarkably cheaply. Um, because the idea that I can give you more and faster and cheaper all at the same time is proved to be quite elusive. I don't know if any others want to comment or expand upon that. So I thought I saw a question on this side of the room, but maybe it was only uh, somebody who was ducking. Um, all right, in the front here then. I, I will, I'll get to you in just a minute. Uh, thank you. I'm Jennifer uh, uh, from Shenzhen Media Group of China. Uh, question is still about uh, uh, nuclear security. Uh, we know Japan is technically capable of going nuclear, which will be the cheapest way of increasing the military capability. So the uh, U.S. quite support Japan to develop nuclear energy. But we know any country that has nuclear power has a potential to make nuclear weapon. So what's your take on it? Thank you. Are you asking what's our take on that? Yeah. Is there any concern from your perspective? We've, uh, the United States has been one of the leading nations over the last several decades of trying to prevent nuclear proliferation. Most recently, uh, it re points to consistently, and in Northeast Asia consistently, to U.S. extended deterrence and U.S. assurances to its northern uh, East Asian allies as one of the bulwarks of nonproliferation during that time. So the United States has been concerned about nonproliferation for a long way, but I would argue um, that the nation that really should be a lot more interested in nonproliferation in Northeast Asia is China. Uh, if China is the cause of the security anxieties that is making its nuclear capable uh, neighbors in the near abroad, to use a term out of, uh, out of the Russia context, worried uh, about whether or not they may need nuclear weapons, perhaps the Chinese ought to be thinking about what are the kinds of things we can do to perhaps ease the security concerns of our neighbors and lead them not to want to pursue nuclear weapons which are well within their capability. Uh, during the Cold War, uh, the United States uh, while being initially reluctant, did accept an independent nuclear France, an independent nuclear uh, England, United Kingdom, because it buttressed deterrence against the Soviet Union. I don't blame the United States for those decisions. I blame the Soviet Union. I'd like to add one other factor to that. I think the, this QDR in particular and to a lesser extent the budget, just simply because I, I can't quite see the details in the budget yet, puts a great emphasis on um, reliance on partners and allies as part of the global security framework. The extent to which that reliance in the uh, total sense of the national security arena uh, is successful, that's the extent to which extended deterrence works better and you need less of a, of a uh, push towards uh, developing independent uh, nuclear capability. Um, I don't know if any other panelists would like to add to that. Uh, Frank, let me uh, take yours, and then I have a, a question from the web, which I'll uh, go to. Hi, Frank Finelli. Uh, David, I would like to broaden your question to be, what more can the administration do to state the case for the higher DOD spending? You mentioned the Opportunity Growth and Security Initiative of $26 billion, but that's $26 billion within an $85 billion administration request. I mean, defense is over 50 percent of, of the discretionary budget of the United States. It's only 30 percent of that OGSI. And so the question is, it's $115 billion plus how much else for non-defense discretionary. 
And so what would your opinion be of what the administration can do to show that DOD is a priority here? Uh, I would say that almost every day I fail to give thanks enough that I'm a security expert, not a health care expert. Um, but uh, but the, the, the nature of the debate, if you will, and I think it's reflected in the comments to my earlier question here about defense, is this is not just a binary discussion of how much money we should be spending on national security. Um, there's a much broader set of questions at work here, and, and at their core, um, there are only two. One is how much government do we want and need and need to have, and the second is how do we pay for it. And I think that it's pretty important to look at the context of the way in which the defense budget is being examined as part of that broader discussion, if you will. Um, I would reflect back to the last time we had this uh, discussion at the national level, and it probably started with the 1980 election, and frankly took about 15 years before we got it resolved to the point where uh, we had pretty much not only reached agreement on what kind of government we needed to have, but it figured out how to pay for it. And then we had about five years of, of surpluses, and then 9-11 uh, happened, and we started all over again. Um, so I think it's useful to keep that perspective, both in terms of the overall dimensions and in terms of the chronological dimensions uh, that, that come into play here, which may be why Clark's comment that we've got to wait until after the 2016 election may not be pessimistic. It may actually be optimistic. Right. I, I would add one thing to it. Uh, when I made my uh, presentation, I pointed out that given current trends, by the time we get to 2021, the end of the Budget Control Act, uh, all money will have been consumed for modernization by other forms of the defense budget. If you look at the federal budget itself, by the time we get to 2038, 2040, current trends continue, uh, there will be no room for discretionary spending. It will be all mandatory spending, uh, given the way the trends are going. Right now, defense and national security in general there's two debates. There's the typical gun, guns versus butter, and then there's entitlements versus guns. And guns are losing both of those debates right now during that time. So national security is gradually being squozen out of the discretionary budget, uh, along with all discretionary spending. Let me uh, work us back down to a, a, a much uh, more pedestrian level question, and then I see I have two more here from the audience. Uh, this comes in from the web, uh, and it particularly focuses on the Army and the funding of the Army. The Army uh, in strength level is actually funded below the QDR level of 450000 at about 420. Uh, and the question is, what's the budget difference and uh, what are the risks? So let me turn to our, our Army expert on the panel here, uh, Dr. Lead. Um, I was actually going to turn the budget part of that question over to you <laughs> because uh, I've forgotten since I, it, I left a while ago and, and can't remember the cost of 10000 in active duty and strength. Is that, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so hopefully you remember it better than I do. But um, with respect to the risks associated with that, um, again, as we've, as we've talked about today, obviously risks a highly subjective uh, word and concept. but. Um, the fundamental the, it, risk associated with it is really one about availability, right? Um, and how much uh, within that active duty construct you have forces that are at, at various stages of availability. You have the institutional army and the operational army, and then um, within the operational army, not all of that is ready to go at any given point in time. And so it's a it's a question of. Um, how much force you have available, and then, uh, as as Secretary Warren talked about, uh, the time the time in which you choose to employ it, and the rotational basis for all of that, and all of that is fairly fungible. So, quantifying the risk is is uh, sort of situation specific. Uh, it's certainly, I think, uh, I believe that the Army leadership has said getting. Um, to the 490,000 that was planned last year uh, as the Army end strength number, uh, they were able to do uh, without taking big force structure cuts. And to get from 490 to 450, they've had to take uh, not just end strength reductions, but structure reductions. If you get down to 420, um, you are taking some much more significant structure cuts. Um, 
and then you get into, are you going to take it out of combat units versus enablers and, and how that all uh, manifests itself. So that's a long way of saying the risk is inherently unknowable. It depends on how you take it. Um, we don't know how they would take it, uh, but it would certainly affect capacity. Uh, and, and the question is um, how, how much and of what types of force? And, and, uh, and that answer gave me time to search my own brain in terms of the dollars associated with it. Uh, and I'm looking at, at Ryan Crotty, who's my uh, uh, lead research fellow on this project. I think when we did the, uh, the four think tank reduction drill, we had that option. And my memory is 10,000 Army in strength active duty was around $600 million a year uh, in associated costs. But when you added in the overhead associated with that, it was pretty close to a billion. Uh, so you're probably looking at 30,000 of three billion a year at a minimum, um, and if you put that into that 115 billion dollar gap, I would also note back to that chart that I showed with that 115 billion. There's another level of optimism associated with that. Built into that red dashed line number is an assumption that DOD will get to pocket all the savings and spend them on something else from all the proposals for military pay and benefits reductions that historically so far Congress has not adopted. Um, that adds back about another $34 billion. So we don't really have a $115 billion gap. We have $115 billion plus $26 billion in FY15 plus another $34 billion over the FIDIP. We've actually got about a $180 billion gap on a $2.5 trillion base, if you will. And that, that's getting up into the 7.5% range. That's starting to be a fairly substantial number in terms of the difference. I've got two questions here in front. Let's start on row three and then move up to row two so you can just pass the mic forward after you're finished. Sure. Tom Geiser, National Defense University. Presumably the challenges that we've described today would be reflected in an updated national security strategy. Are you aware to what extent that these efforts have been synchronized with uh, those attempts to update our national security strategy uh, to ensure that they're in alignment? Thank you. I'm not aware of synchronization or the absence of synchronization, but it'll be the very first question we try to ask when we see that national security strategy uh, after it comes out. And look for the same panel to be reassembled to provide commentary on that very point. Thanks, Tom. Uh, okay. We were assured that the national security strategy would be out well before the QDR. Patrick? Patrick Garvey with Triple Canopy. Uh, one of the th things I love coming over here for is hearing the perspective of former DOD officials who know what these people are thinking when they write, because um, you've all been there and done that. And, and as you've all indicated in your response to recovered, um, uh, in your response to David's first question, you kind of indicated universally that there was this half-hearted attempt at making the case um, for what the world with BCA caps might look like. Um, they have to know what the Congress is looking for, which makes me believe that they know what the Congress is looking for, but they're not, they're only half-hearted in their, in their desire to make the worst case scenario. I mean, if, if, you're, if your strategy at, on the whole is passive and you're not going to impl use the force to implement a foreign policy, then how can you advocate for a larger force? When, in the budget itself, as I understand it right now, and there is some confusion about the FY15 budget request, uh, the Army is funded to only 320,000 over the five, 420,000 over the period. So you have to find the money to add back to the 440, 450 that they would like to have. The Marines to 175. The, uh, I can't speak to the to the Air Force, the Air Force is not funded for the A-10s, although they didn't even mention A-10s in the QDR. Uh, but they did mention the KC-10s. They're apparently not funded for that either. So there's a number of unpaid bills that are in the budget. Uh, uh, my feeling is, is that, uh, unlike a couple of my colleagues here, is that for a defense document, they were fairly clear about what would happen if the BCA levels were imposed from F-16 on. It would be a loss of, of modernization, it would be a loss of programs, it would be a loss of force structure. And these are pretty deep force structures in a relatively brief period of time. Um, that having been said, 
the other part of your question gets at the issue of under what circumstances do you use military capabilities to do things. And the QDR said, as I pointed out in my opening comments, that we would be selective and tailored in our engagement with U.S. forces. Um, uh, there's a lot of ambiguity. There's a big debate that goes on when you're trying Do you use red lines and be explicit? Or do you be ambiguous about what you're going to do? Uh, we've seen how well red lines have worked recently. Um, and, you know, as others have pointed out, when red lines are there, people poke them. They want to see how soft they are. They want to do this. So there's an art to it. It is not just the science of how many forces you have. I wouldn't characterize their arguments to the Congress as half-hearted. Um, I guess I would, I, I don't accept the proposition that there's anything that the De Defense Department could have said that would have necessarily answered the congressional mail. Um, again, I don't accept that there's a, a that Congress is, is waiting with pen in hand to write a bill uh, as soon as the Defense Department clarifies that, you know, the sky will fall. Um, Again, I don't think there's an argument that they could have made that's going to change the fundamental dynamic on the Hill. So to me, it's not, they, it's not that they don't understand. It's not that they're misguided or uninformed or um, don't read the newspapers or watch TV. It's that, and, and you will note, Congress moved the goalposts, right? Last year, they said, oh, you haven't told us enough, you haven't told us enough. And then they come and say, okay, well, here's, here's what it would be, and immediately get blasted by saying, okay, well, that... That doesn't. That we we're not going to we're not going to deal with what you told us anyway. So you've articulated the risk, and we don't care. So um, again, I don't I don't put uh, much fault on the Defense Department for not being explicit enough because that's not the fundamental uh, solution to the ba more basic challenge of what does the Congress want to do about discretionary spending in the context of mandatory spending, right? So the, the Defense Department can't deal with that. I mean, this is, it's not, it's not about defense. I have a different perspective on this, which is, again, I wouldn't characterize it as half-hearted either. I just don't think, and I don't, I don't agree that, you know, members of Congress don't read the newspaper. I, I think, or I members that. of the administration or the executive branch don't read the newspaper. The thing is, I don't think, when you're thinking logically, when you're a Defense Department official and you're thinking logically about how to make your argument, I think the Defense Department has fallen into the trap of making an argument to themselves. Um, and not understanding because there is a credibility gap and because they haven't been able to, um, for whatever reason, <coughs> create enduring relationships with key members on the Hill. I mean, they have to a certain extent, but when it comes to this issue, I don't think they've gotten, I'm not talking about co-opting members of Congress, I'm talking about working with them to understand what is your perspective and what can we do together as partners? And even Christine Wormuth mentioned it earlier, is that now the step is to go and, and engage Congress. Well, yes, thank you for rolling your eyes. That should have happened a little bit ago. Um, so I don't think their effort has been half-hearted. I think it's been um, very logical from their perspectives. Um, but you have to understand, as you well do, Patrick, that not all members of Congress are equally on board with Defense Department logic. Um, because they, they see different they have different perspectives on it. And the lack of credibility and the lack of relationships really damages the case. D just two quick points. The, the first one is obviously anything that's said in front of Congress is said to allies and adversaries alike. So I think it, in, in both the document and in the statements that we've seen from senior defense leaders, a, a lot from the, from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I mean, standing up all of them, and saying that there's a remarkable degree of risk, that the United States is at risk, that there's going to be a diminution in, in our ability to defend the nation. That's about as clear as you can get publicly without going into the specifics. So I hope they follow up with the staffs and members and others with those 
specifics and that they're, they, don't, they don't hold back. And I think, you know, it is a step forward, I think, in, in, in the chess game, albeit DOD is still a, a hostage in this to some degree. But for the White House to have allowed a, a QDR that is this forthright is, is a change uh, in, in tone. Um, thanks. Folks, you all have been most generous with your time this afternoon. You've given us two hours. Uh, we are clearly not exhausting all the possibilities of discussion uh, on this topic. And, uh, and I think as both more information uh, becomes uh, publicly available and as the dynamic evolves, we'll revisit it again and again. I want to thank you all for your attendance here this afternoon. I'll ask you to join me in thanking the panel. And with that, we're adjourned.